Psalm chapter 1. And we're only going to read the first two verses. Psalms chapter 1. And we're only going to read today the first two verses. And the King James text today reads as follows. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Amen. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. When you bow your heads with me one more moment this afternoon. Master, once again, God, we come to you, Lord. We come to you, God, because the time has come in this service when the Word of God must go forth. Today, Master, my body is struggling. My allergies are at full bloom. And I need the help of the Holy Ghost more than usual if I'm to be a blessing or a help or an encouragement to the people of God. Anoint today the speaker. Help me, Lord, to deliver the Word of God faithfully, truthfully, in love that the people of God might benefit thereby. Help it, Lord, to find good ground upon which to fall that it might spring forth and bring fruit unto righteousness in our lives for your name's sake. We ask it all today in none other than Jesus' precious saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to talk to us for a little while. I don't think it will be very long today. I want to talk to us on the topic, You are your posse. You are your posse. The English Standard Version of Psalm 1 Verses 1 and 2 reads, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. I've taught this church the importance of understanding the nature of each and every book of the Bible. The roles they play differ. Not every word, contrary to fundamentalist and evangelical thought, is law. Not every state and every statement is a mandate or a commandment. In the instance of the book of Psalms, it's important that we understand this is a book of wisdom. If you want the best life you can live, if you want the best testimony you can have, if you want the best walk with God that you can experience, then words of wisdom that will help you to achieve these things may be found in this wonderful book of Psalms. Many believers make the fatal mistake of thinking that they can regularly hang with a crowd of unbelievers or those who live contrary to the manner in which believers are expected to live, and their lives will not be negatively impacted. My friend, I've got news for you today. According to the wisdom of Psalms, this is very unwise. 
This is not the wisdom we find in the Word of God. The company we keep has a major impact on the life we will live and our Christian experience which we walk. There's a difference between you cannot do this and you should not do this. Or doing this is not at all good for you. Am I telling the truth? Uh -huh. Well, I'm here to tell you. <coughs> In the book of Psalm, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God is not saying you're going to hell if. But He is saying if you want to be blessed, if you want a good life, if you want your experience with God to be fruitful and bountiful, if you want to experience the favor of the Almighty, then it is best that you not walk with the advice or the instruction of the ungodly or the wicked. It's best that you not keep company with those who regularly commit grievous sin or those who today would scorn God or who would uh, make fun of God or make fun of faith or try to chip away at your faith. A believer ought to be one today who delights in the word of the Lord. And it's on that word that he meditates day and night. I won't tell you. I could go back all the way to when I was a kid and I can tell you right now. I can be sitting in a movie watching a movie and my mind is still contemplating the Word of God. I have a cousin by marriage many years ago made a comment to my mother and he said, you know, he said, I've learned one thing about Chuck. He said, if you watch him, he said, he'll be sitting there talking to you. He said, and he'll be having a whole conversation with you. He said, but the whole time you can tell that his brain is like somewhere else. He's thinking about something else. I, I just have that ability. I don't know. I, it, it's, it's just something I do. Now, there are times when I cannot be distracted. For instance, if I'm reading something and Tommy comes in and starts talking to me, I may acknowledge him trying to be nice, but there's a good chance I haven't heard a word he said because when I'm reading, I tend to be very singularly focused. But I do have the ability personally to kind of think in two different directions simultaneously. The Lord can be working a message in my spirit and I'll be meditating on that message and the whole time I'm meditating on that message I'm watching a movie. Or the whole time I'm, I'm contemplating that message I'm sitting there having a conversation with somebody and it's not that I'm not engaged in the conversation because I am. But I have this background operation. You know, those of us that work with computers understand that you have those programs that work in the foreground and then you have those programs that work in the background. Well, for me, the program that works in the background 24-7 is meditation on the Word of God, literally. That, that's, that literally is what my brain is doing constantly. And... I'll be contemplating things, and I don't talk to Tommy about it, I don't talk to anybody about it, because honestly, I know that not everybody is, is uh, wired like I am, and it might be overload for other people. If I were to talk to you about every thought that comes through my head, and everything that I meditate on, and every, you know, you, after a while you get tired of hearing it. But this is just something that I do. And every time I read Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2, but he delights in the law of the Lord and on his law doth he meditate day and night. Every single time I read that passage, I think to myself and I say, Lord, 
that is my experience. That is what I experience. I love the Word of God. I love to think about the Word of God. I love to meditate on the Word of God. I love to contemplate the Word of God. And I do so almost constantly. In Proverbs 13 and verse 20, the word of the Lord reads from the King James text, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. That same passage in the English Standard Version reads, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. In Proverbs 18, verse 24, the King James reads, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. The English Standard Version of Proverbs 18, 24 reads, A man of many companions may come to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know, it's sad that in our world today, people worship celebrity. People think that there is some wonderful thing about being a celebrity. There's something wonderful about having uh, all kinds of people who worship you and admire you and appreciate you. Well, I've got news for you. For as many people as worship and admire and appreciate a celebrity, generally speaking, there are at least half as many who hate their guts. <laughs> The sad thing is we have people in this life, including Christians, who think that it is their life mission to get as many people on this planet in the friends column as they could possibly get. Tommy, they like to go to the bars and they like to hang out at the clubs and oh, they like to have all these people around them that they can call friends. Yet, I know from personal experience, I've seen it in my own life, I've seen it in the lives of others, that these same people who are happy to hang out with you at the club and happy to hang out with you at the bar uh, don't want to know you when it comes time to move or don't want to know you when you're in a situation where you have a need and they might be able to minister to that need. No, they're friends when being a friend is fun. They're friends when being a friend is convenient. But they're not really interested in truly genuinely being your friend. Hello now. And unfortunately, many people, even in the Christian world, they just love to surround themselves with folks, and they think by having a multitude of friends that they've really got something special. But the Word of the Lord instructs us from Proverbs, another book of wisdom, that there is a friend who sticketh closer than a brother, meaning... You can have a thousand friends who are fair weather friends who only be there for you when it's convenient and when it's fun. And then you can have one friend who's like a sibling. And when you need them, bless God, they're there. Oh, I mean, when you're in trouble, they're there. When things are good, they're there. When you're sad, they're there. When you're happy, they're there. Amen. And they hold you up, and they bolster you up, and they encourage you, and they inspire you. What is more valuable, to have a thousand fair-weather friends or to have that one true good friend? Well, I know in my life... I'm the kind of person, I, I don't like throwing people away. I, I value human beings too much for that. I, I don't know. You know, when I came out in 1989, and I, I really had never dated much or anything uh, before I came out, and when I came out in 1989, and I began to go out and date and what have you, uh, I, I didn't have a whole lot of experience with it, and I realized that most people are of the mindset that if we no longer 
have any romantic interest in one another, then what's the sense even talking to one another? What's the sense even being bothered with one another? Well, I was, I was not of that mindset. I, I never quite understood that mindset. I had people that I dated that I came, you know, to a place and I said, well, you know, I like this person, they're a nice person, but there are certain attributes, there are certain traits that I absolutely would not want in a partner, that I can tell you. But I can handle it in a friend, amen. And let me tell you, a lot of friends that I've had now for decades, decades, uh, I dated at one time. And we determined that we did not have, or I determined, or they determined, somebody determined we didn't have uh, any further romantic interest to pursue. But I could not throw that person away. There was no need in throwing them away. There was no need in discarding them. I just needed to change the compartment. You know, I needed to change the nature of the relationship that I had with them. One of my best friends in the world, somebody that I was friends with for decades, and he passed away a few years ago. And uh, we started out, we dated a little bit, and then I decided, no, this isn't quite what I wanted a partner, but I was more than happy to have it in a friend. And that person, that individual, was such a wonderful friend to me, was there for me, encouraged me, supported me, uh, was there for our work uh, that I was doing, our affirming work in New York City, our affirming work in Connecticut, our affirming work in uh, Georgia, and then even here in Texas. So friendship that is real and substantive is far more important than simply having a number of friends. At least that is the wisdom of God's Word. In Psalm 141 verses 4 through 5, Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity. And let me not eat of their dainties. Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. I'm using the English Standard Version a lot today to help clarify some things for you. The English Standard Version of Psalm 141, 4 and 5 said, Do not let my heart incline to any evil, to busy miss myself with wicked deeds in company with men who work iniquity. And let me not eat of their delicacies. Let a righteous man strike me, it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. I'm talking today about you are your posse. Folks, I'm going to tell you, you cannot hang with a crowd without taking on some of the attributes of the crowd you're hanging with at some point. You hang with folks who drink too much, and there's a good likelihood you're going to start drinking too much. Amen. You hang with folks who have very loose morals and uh, don't really put any brakes on themselves in terms of bad behavior, and you may find yourself allowing yourself to do things that you know better than to do.
The truth today is too many Christians are not at all careful about who it is that uh, they include in their posse. We know the term posse in the hip-hop world is those people who hang around you, those people who hang with you, you know, your regular group of friends. I'm not talking about keeping company once in a while with folks who aren't believers or people who might do things you you don't agree with or don't approve of. Jesus was friends to publicans and sinners. I don't believe there's anything wrong with it. I'm not talking about the occasional. I'm talking about your posse, those with whom you regularly hang. We as human beings tend to be pack animals. We don't look at ourselves that way. We don't think of ourselves that way. But we really are. We're pack animals. We get around a pack of folks and before too long we start acting like the pack. Am I telling the truth? I know for me personally, <coughs> excuse me, I come from a family on the mother's side. According to my great uncle, a lot of this is cultural, and it has to do with Portuguese uh, culture. And uh, he told me once, he said, you know, on Cape Cod, where he grew up, he said, Portuguese women just sit around griping and groaning about their husbands all the time. He said, there's something about, it's almost like they think that's what they're supposed to do. He said, now, are they really miserable? Are they really unhappy with their husbands? No, they're not. But they're, it's almost like that's just what a wife is supposed to do, is gripe about her husband. Well, I grew up with my grandmother, who's full-blooded Portuguese. My grandmother was in the habit of constantly griping about my grandfather. Now, she had a lot to gripe about. But... Uh, on my mother's side of the family, there's kind of a trait that runs through the whole bloodline. And it's like, if, if people on that side of the family can't be griping about something, they're just not happy. There's got to be something they can complain about. There's got to be something they can be negative about. And do you know, I found myself, when I would go to my grandmother's house, or I'll go to certain aunts or uncles' houses, I find myself kind of falling into that ditch. I find myself falling into that pattern when I get around them, because otherwise, I don't know what to talk about with them. I don't know what topic of conversation is good or what topic of conversation isn't good. Seem like the only thing they ever want to talk about is stuff you can gripe about. And before I know it, I'm talking about which actors I don't like and which movies I didn't like and which commercial on television I didn't like and which television show I don't like. You know what I'm talking about? Because we're pack animals. And it's important that we understand this. And it's important that we be careful just exactly who we include in our posse. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people go to church and they don't really think about what does that church bring out in me by going to that church I don't mean just what the preacher preaches I mean keeping company with that group of folks what do they bring out in you I remember when I first came to Riverside Church of God and, uh, at 16 years old. Here I was, a kid from Connecticut. I come down to Texas. Well, in Connecticut, we tended to be a lot sharper with our tongue. We tended to be a lot more critical. We tended to be more negative, I hate to say, a lot of times. All of a sudden, I come down to Riverside Church of God and I found people who were much sweeter in their spirit and they were much more careful about what they said. And they weren't inclined to say negative things about anybody, you know. And all of a sudden I, I'm hanging out with this church full of folks and there are positive attributes in them that I did not possess. But you know what? Hanging out with that posse, hanging out with that group of folks 
brought out better things than me. All of a sudden, I begin to manifest better things. I'm going to tell you, if there's any reason in the world to pick a good church to be part of, it's because a good church can help bring out the best in you. Because I'm going to tell you, you hang out with the wrong bunch and they'll bring out the worst in you. Am I telling the truth? But when you hang out with good folks, when you hang out with godly folks, when you hang out with folks who may not be perfect, but by God, they're giving it their best shot. Amen. It helps you to reach for the stars. It helps you to try to achieve better and to be better. Amen. The Word of God tells us today, Excuse me, in Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his way, and get a snare to thy soul. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, the word of the Lord tells us, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good matters. The English Standard Version of 1 Corinthians 15, 33 states, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. There is one specifically prescribed instruction in the New Testament from the Apostle Paul that relates to the nature of the company we keep. But again, it's important to understand the, the accurate meaning and application of this passage. While it does speak of purposeful separation, it does not speak of our isolating ourselves from unbelievers or those we might consider sinners. Jesus kept company with sinners. But there are lines that ought to be recognized, honored, and maintained. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, the Apostle Paul writes, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I, dwell, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now I'm going to tell you, I don't know why God lays certain messages on my heart at certain times, but i come to understand that Every time I question the Lord for why He lays a certain message on me, without fail, somebody out there needs to hear exactly what I'm talking about. So somebody out here today in the audience is needing to hear what I'm saying. The English Standard Version of 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18 states, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness what accord has Christ with Belial or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever what agreement has the temple of God with idols for we are the temple of the living God as God said I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. 
then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me says the Lord Almighty in this passage the Apostle Paul specifically and purposefully uses the term yoked he said be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers the term yoked speaks specifically to being bound together or joined united or sharing in a common purpose or goal he also goes on to use examples which clearly speak of idolatry and doctrine Therefore, we ought not to join ourselves to those who would potentially cause our faith, <coughs> excuse me, doctrine, or commitment to our God to be compromised. <coughs> Believers are not uh, instructed to avoid the company of unbelievers or sinners, but rather we are told not to be bound to such as these. When we join with someone, we become one with them in a mystical sense. Even business partners join themselves together for a common cause or purpose. In the case of business, that purpose is to make money. In the instance of marriage, a couple is joined for the purpose of creating a family, a bond that is permanent and unbreakable, uh, every bit as much as a blood relationship. Clubs, secret societies, and organizations whose purpose and mission is inconsistent with Christian principles are not to be part of the lives of God's people. It is a sad commentary on the church today that so many believers act foolishly toward those who are outside of the church in the name of being faithful to the God of the church. If you're not invited into their bed to participate in some forbidden sexual activity, then you have no legitimate biblical grounds for avoiding or mistreating one who engages in sexual conduct with which you disagree. Who we enter into fellowship with or join for the purpose of a singular cause defines to the world who we are. This is one reason why the evangelical church has forever done itself irreparable harm by joining itself to the man Donald Trump. Because now the world looks and they look at Trump and they look at the church and the church tries to say, oh, we understand he's not everything he ought to be, but He's doing everything we want him to do, therefore we support him. But by joining themselves to his cause, the world looks upon the church now and sees it in the same exact way it sees him. You'd better be careful about being unequally yoked with unbelievers. It also shapes today who we are as human beings. As human beings cannot help but be impacted and affected by those with whom we surround ourselves. Surround yourself with folks who cuss and you'll find yourself cussing. Surround yourself with immoral people and you will find your own morality being corrupted. Surround yourself with unethical people and you will find your own ethics being compromised. Surround yourself with folks who emulate what you would like to be and they will help to inspire and to encourage you to rise to higher heights and dive to deeper depths becoming that better person that better child of God that you so desire to be. Children, 
I know this has been an awful short service today, but I hope you understand with my going through my allergies the way I am, uh, I had to be real succinct today. But this is the word the Lord laid on my heart for today. Somebody needs to understand we need to be careful about who we surround ourselves with. We need to be careful about who we allow to become part of our posse. The old saying goes, a man is known by the company he keeps. Another old saying says that birds of a feather flock together. Amen. Uh, if you hang out with a crowd and the reputation of the majority in that crowd is such, uh, then chances are somebody seeing you with that crowd immediately is going to attach their reputation to you. Amen. I'm very careful about uh, not doing certain things and, and not going certain places. And, and uh, Tommy can tell you, I've lived in Dallas now for uh, over 20 years, and I don't make a habit of going into Oaklawn. Now, is there anything wrong with Oaklawn? No, there's nothing wrong with Oaklawn. Are the people in Oaklawn wicked and evil? You don't know. That's not what I'm saying either. But at the same time, people who are up to no good, <laughs> a lot of times the very place they want to go is Oaklawn. They want to cruise. They want to look for something, you know, cheap and easy. They go to Oklahoma. Well, I don't want folks seeing me hanging out there and, and attaching that reputation to me. The Word of God says to abstain from the very appearance of evil. So we want to guard our integrity. We want to guard our testimony. And we want to be careful that by reason of our associations, we don't bring our testimony and our witness into question. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you today, children. I remember years ago, I'll close with this. I remember I was just a kid. Probably all of 10 years old, maybe. And my mother and my dad decided they were going to go to uh, Cape Cod to visit some family up there. And have a little bit of a vacation and they left my brother Michael and I actually I wasn't even 10 because Dallas wasn't even born yet it's probably 7 or 8 they left my brother Michael and I with an uncle and an aunt my uncle Walt and my aunt Shirley well I didn't know my uncle and aunt very well all I knew is that on the mother's side of the family, everybody on that side of the family went to church, and, you know, we were all part of the Pentecostal church and all that. On my dad's side of the family, they didn't go to church, and they didn't do all that. So I go to my uncle and my aunt's house, and we're sitting down at a meal, and I'd heard a joke at school that was kind of... Uh, Dirty, it wasn't, it, not dirty. It wasn't a dirty joke. It was uh, uh, off color. Yeah, off color. That's the word I guess we use. Now, because I was hanging out with my family that I didn't know very well, and I kind of thought of them as being, you know, the unchurched side of the family, I figured I might win points with them. <laughs> if I shared this joke over the dinner table. Well, my poor aunt about dropped her teeth out of her head. It just used a word, you know, an ugly word, and it wasn't, it wasn't a vulgar joke or anything, you know. And uh, it was a play on words, and, and it used a nasty word in it. And I told this joke, you know, and my uncle kind of looked, and my aunt, her eyes about popped out of her head. And I realized rather quickly that, oops, um, maybe this joke wasn't as welcome here as I thought it was. But you know, when we get around certain people and we have a perception of those people, we tend to do things and say things that we think are going to fit in with them better because we want to fit in. We, we don't want to feel like the odd man out. And I want to tell you today, you are your posse. If there's ever been a time 
in the history of the church when God's people need to look for and find others who are sincere, who love the Lord, who are trying their best to do right and live right. Today is the time. The Word of God said, Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as is the custom of some, but even the more as you see the day approaching. I want to tell you, children, we need each other. Amen. We need each other. I need the church. I've been saying this for years. One of the primary reasons that I've been trying to build a church for all these years is not because I'm looking for a salary. It's not because I'm looking uh, to pet my ego. It's because I know the value of a good church. And I've desired to surround myself with good people who can help me bring out the best in me. Amen. Because I understand today, without any fear of contradiction, the wisdom of God's Word teaches you are your posse. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon?